Welcome friends to this new lecture of soil science technology in week 6 and in this final lecture of week 6 we will try to finish the soil salinity and alkalinity and then we will try to finish the submerged soils. So, uh, in the last lecture we stopped here uh, while discussing about the leaching requirement. So, we discuss about the uh, you know salt balance equation by uh, you know discussing these 4 inputs and 4 uh, salt outputs. So, let us see what is leaching requirement. So, the main concern is to balance in case of leaching requirement the main concern is to balance the salt coming in with the irrigation water and the leaving the salt that is leaving with the drainage water. So, obviously, we will be concerned about whether the salt which is coming through irrigation water equals to the salt which is moving uh, you know through the drainage water or not. The amount of salt is calculated as the product of the volume of water in centimeter and the amount of salt. So, obviously, the you know <coughs> you know uh, the volume of water in centimeter and the amount of salts. So, you can see it is a multiplication factor d multiplied by E c. So, the equation will be d i w in multiplied by E c i w. So, d i w is basically the volume of the water in of the irrigation water of and d d w is the volume of drainage water and E c i w and E c d w are the respective um, um, uh, electrical conductivity or salt concentration. So, obviously, so if from this equation we can see E c i w by E c d w is equal to d c w by d, you know d d w by d i w. So, E c i w by E c d w is basically uh, termed as leaching requirement. So, this is the formula of leaching requirement. So, let us go and see one example numerical example of leaching requirement. So, here consider the situation where the irrigation water has an E c i w of 2.5 decimals per meter and a moderately tolerant crop like broccoli is to be grown for a moderately tolerant crop and we generally we can use the 8 decimals per meter as the acceptable ED ECDW EC to produce 90 percent of the maximum yield. So, obviously, uh, you know here we can see the leaching requirement is uh, leaching requirement is E c i w by E c d w. So, 2.5 by 8 that is 0 0.31. Now, 0 0.31 is basically multiplied by the amount of water. So, 12 centimeter of water we can see here. Uh, so, if there is a 12 centimeter you know uh, of water. So, that is 3.7 centimeter or this 3.7 centimeter water is the minimum amount of water needed to maintain the root zone uh, salinity at the acceptable level. So, this uh, you know 3.7 centimeter of water is a minimum amount of water that needed to maintain the root zone salinity at the acceptable level. So, this is how we calculate the leaching requirement and uh, let us move ahead and see some more uh, you know more uh, aspects of soil salinity obviously how to manage the soil salinity obviously irrigation giving the irrigation water uh, you know good quality of irrigation water is the one of the major way of controlling the irrigation controlling the soil salinity irrigation water testing has to be done before applying the irrigation water into the soil because soil sometime irrigation water itself is saline so the quality of irrigation water is very much important and split application of irrigation water is always better than ponding of irrigation water and secondly the growing of salt tolerant crop is very much important for uh, managing the salt uh, you know soil salinity it is the most effect effective way for uh, getting some productivity from this uh, region uh, of uh, problematic soils so uh, <coughs> management of soil salinity we know at the declaration of saline sodic soil and sodic soil obviously the sodium ion is replaced by cations like calcium and pH of the soil is basically reduced by adding the acid forming substances generally gypsum we use. Now, gypsum is generally used to reclaim sodic soil where exchange complex does not have calcium ions. So, otherwise any acid forming substance can be used for reclamation where calcium ions are present in the exchange complex. So, when the exchange complex is not having any calcium we can add gypsum and if the exchange complex is having the calcium we can uh, we can we can add any acid forming substances which will further reduce the pH of the sodic soil. 
So, when you add the gypsum, you can see sodium, the gypsum formula is uh, you, know, you know basically it is calcium sulphate. So, <coughs> sodium bicarbonate as you can see reacts with the calcium sulphate to produce the calcium carbonate and sodium sulphate which is leachable and cal cal uh, carbon dioxide and water and this uh, you know this is for sodium bicarbonate and in case of sodium carbonate obviously the calcium sulphate again reacts to form insoluble calcium carbonate which is precipitated out and leachable sodium sulphate which is uh, getting out from the soil. And obviously, when the colloidal co exchange complex is dominated by sodium, when you add calcium, the one calcium cation can replace two sodium to form sodium sulphate, which is basically leachable. And you can see the exchange complex is again uh, occupied by calcium. So, these are the ways through which gypsum reclaim the soil sodicity. If the exchange complex is already having the sodium, already having the calcium, then uh, you know, obviously. Uh, we have to use some other uh, salt uh, you know uh, acid pr producing compound. So, obviously you know we, we are adding some H2SO4. So, you can see sodium bicarbonate is reacting with H2SO4 to produce sodium sulphate which is again leachable and because of sodium carbonate is again reacting with H2SO4 to produce sodium sulphate which is again leachable. So, these are uh, some of the ways to manage chemically the sodic salts. So, uh, there is another problem we must solve. Now, how much gypsum is needed to reclaim a sodic soil with an ESP of 25 percent and a catenation capacity of 18 mole uh, charge per kg. Now, assume that you want to reduce the ESP of the upper 30 centimeter to about 5 percent so that a crop like alfalfa could be grown. Now, in case of solution you can see we have to first determine the amount of sodium ions that to be replaced by multiplying the CEC which is 18 in our case by the change of sodium saturation desired. So, our initial sodium saturation was 25 percent. Now, we want that uh, you know uh, you know now we want that it has you know the sodium saturation percent uh, should be 5 percent. So, the reduction is 25 minus 5 that is 20 percent you can see here. Now, obviously, now the next step we are multiplying 18 centimoles charge per kg with the 0 0.20 or 20 percent. So, we are getting 3.6 centimoles charge per kg. So, this is the first step. So, let us see the second step. So, from the reaction that occurs from the gypsum that is calcium sulphate to H2O is applied you can see here 2 sodium is getting replaced by 1 calcium you know uh, calcium and ultimately it is following it is producing the colloid with calcium and sodium sulphate and water. So, you can see here from this reaction 3.6 centimole charge of calcium sulphate 2 H 2 will be needed to replace 3.6 centimole charge of sodium it is we know we know that. So, 3.6 centimole charge of sodium we have already calculated that has to be replaced by 3.6 centimole charge of calcium sulphate. Now, secondly calculate the weight in grams of gypsum needed to provide this 3.6 centimole charge per kg of soil. Now, this can be done by first dividing the molecular weight of calcium sulphate to H2 that is 172 by 2 because calcium ion has 2 uh, valency 2 charges and sodium has only 1 and then by 100 further then we have to divide it further by 100 because we are dealing with the centimole rather than the mole. So, uh, basically if we see uh, in the next slide ultimately we are uh, dividing the 172 by 2 that is 86 gram of calcium sulphate we need 86 gram of gypsum or molecular charge and then further we are uh, converting it to uh, you know 0 0.86 gram of gypsum per semol charge uh, centimole charge is required to replace 1 centimole charge of sodium. So, the 3.6 centimole charge sodium per kg would require 3.6 centimole per kg multiplied by 0 0.86 centimole charge. So, we are getting 3.1 gram of calcium sulphate or 2H2. So, we are basically getting 3.1 gram of gypsum per kg of soil. Last to express this in terms of amount of gypsum needed to treat 1 hectare of land to a soil depth of 30 centimeter, we have to multiply by 4 into 10 to the power 6, which is twice the weight of kg of 50 centimeter deep hectare forest slice. So, if the forest slice depth is 15 centimeter, which is also 6 inches. 
so that the weight of this 15 centimeter ferro slice is basically 2 multiplied by 10 to the power 6 uh, below kg however in case of 30 centimeter obviously that will be doubled so 4 into 10 to the power 6 kg we have to multiply by that so 3.1 gram per kg multiplied by 4 into 10 to the power 6 kg per hectare and we are getting this so basically we are getting 12400 kg of gypsum per hectare so this is the uh, this is the final solution of this problem so guys uh, i hope that you have understood this uh, understood this solution and if you have any further queries you can email me regarding its uh, regarding its explanation i'll be more than happy to answer it so let us uh, uh, move ahead and uh, go to our next uh, topic that is submerged soils obviously submerged soils will cover the submerged soils in its types and then characteristics of different submerged soils and importance of submerged soils so you know that submerged soils are the uh, you know soils that are submerged in water for a sufficient period of time to give the distinct horizon development differentiating from other soil is called submerged soils so, now submerged soil material generally influence the type of soil which develops from it Secondly, the type of aquatic life and crop it, support, it supports and finally, the capacity of these sediments uh, to act as a sink for terrestrial weights. So, these are important influences of submerged soils. So, there are four types of submerged soils. What are those? First of all, waterlogged soils. Secondly, marsh soils. Third is paddy soil and finally, subaquatic soils. So, in case of waterlogged soil, we call it glade soil. So, Characteristics of these waterlogged soils are given are given by these distinctive glay horizon. So you can see distinctive glay horizon. You can see here. So a mortal have a partially oxidized a horizon. So this glay horizon have a partially oxidized a horizon, and a mortal intermediate zone and a bluish green permanent reduced zone. You can see it is a bluish green permanently reduced zone. And uh, uh, obviously, the waterlogged soil can be found in any climatic zone, and saturation may be due to the impervious soil layer or high groundwater table. So, this is the characteristics of waterlogged soil or glay soil. Second important is marsh soil. So, mostly permanently saturated or waterlogged, these are mostly permanently saturated or waterlogged, and they are basically characterized by plant residue in surface horizon or premature or, or, or permanently reduced G horizon or glade horizon. So, they can be found in fringes of lakes, streams or estuaries or deltas as you can see here and when exposed to aeration it gives basically rise to acid sulphate soil. We have already discussed acid sulphate soil uh, in soil acidity. So, these uh, marsh soils are the region where this acid sulphate soil can be found. Now, finally, paddy soils, paddy soils are specially managed for paddy. Uh, production and horizon develop depends on period of water logging. We generally do puddling for making a impervious layer. Thus, those there is a always a standing water at the base of the plant, and iron and manganese usually elevated from top soil and deposit below the plowed soil in this paddy soil. And submerges decreases the redox potential EH, which promotes the growth of the paddy. Now, if you see the paddy soil profile obviously you will see obviously this is the surf, surface water and just below the surface water you will see very thin oxidized layer and below the thin oxidized layer you will see a permanently reduced layer where all the reduced fraction of different minerals and different nutrients are present we will discuss them later on. So, Another is subaqueous soil. Now, the uppermost layer of unconsolidated aqueous, aqueous, aqueous sediment of lakes, oceans, and rivers are called subaquatic soils, and they are permanently submerged cumulative soils. And finally, they have varied horizon development. You can see uh, subaqueous uh, sub uh, soil profile. And uh, you know, let us see what are the characteristics of the submerged soils. So, first important characteristics is low oxygen. Obviously, the oxygen diffusion is 10,000 times lower in water field pores than in air field pores and in this type of soil specially. And these soils are anoxic be be below the soil water interface because of low oxygen diffusion, they are basically anoxic in nature. And a thin oxidized zone is created in the upper 1 to 2 centimeter due to diffusion of oxygen from the atmosphere. So, as I showed you, 
in case of paddy soil profile there is a thin 1 to 2 centimeter upper oxidized zone due to the diffusion of oxygen from the atmosphere and finally, a true anaerobic zone below this oxidized zone is a typical characteristics of a uh, submerged soil. So, just below the oxidized zone you will see an anaerobic zone. Second is oxidized mud water interface obviously, the mud water interface may contain, you know, may contain sufficient oxygen and this oxygen reduce abruptly with depth obviously and chemical and microbi microbiological re regime in this oxidized zone is similar to aerobic soil and this zone is of out, you know, utmost importance because it acts as a sink for phosphate and many other nutrients. Thirdly, the presence of hydrophytic plants is characterized by these submerged soils. So, these uh, presence of these uh, hydrophytic plants you can see in the submerged soils that these plants either have oxygen transport from aerial part or, resp or, or they can respire anaerobically. You can see here the adventitious, advent adventitious roots of maple tree and obviously, uh, you know in case of paddy you have seen the arenchyma tissue to capture the atmospheric oxygen. So, an oxidized rhizosphere zone is created as oxygen is transported from shoot to the roots. And finally, the, the soil reduction obviously, a submerged soil uh, is in a reduced zone due to the anaerobic condition except the brown oxidized zone at the surface that is 1 to 2 centimeter oxidized zone and rather than a well drained soil obviously and will get a gray or greenish color in this type of soil and finally, it has reduced counterpart of various ions. This anaerobic zone basically contains different reduced counterparts of various ions. Now, a very important concept is redox potential. The redox potential formula is e, you know redox potential generally term in terms of E h. Now, E h is basically E 0 plus R t by N f L n log of O x by R e d. Now, E h is the voltage of the reaction that is redox potential, E h basically the redox potential and E 0 is the voltage when oxidized and reduced reduction uh, you know are both at unity and then you know ox and red are the activities of the oxidized and reduced species. So, basically E 0 when the oxidized and uh, you know or, or and, and the reduced species are having the uh, you know have the have the same concentration. Now, F is the Faraday constant, R is the universal gas constant, N is the charge of valency of iron and finally, T is the temperature. So, you can see E H basically general you know represent whether a soil is oxidized or not. So, in case of oxidized soil the E H value will be higher, in case of reduced soil the E H value will be lower. So, you can see here as a result of change of E H uh, you know after submergence. So, at the beginning there will be high pH because high E H because of oxidized condition, but as a result of prolonged submergence their oxygen will be oxygen will be reduced and as a result the E H or redox potential will be reduced further. So, you can see for all the soils, for all three soils the final uh, after 2 weeks of time the final E H is uh, you know negative sufficiently negative and all the, you know these uh, this negative E H basically indicates the re reduced condition of the soil. So, redox potential of a submerged soil are having some important implication. First of all, E H is a quantitative measure of the tendency of a given system to oxidize or reduce susceptible substances and E H is a positive obviously, I have told you E H is positive and high in strongly oxidizing system and is negative uh, and low in strongly reducing condition and the electrochemical property helps in distinguishing a submerged soil from a well, dra well drained area using the E H. Now, as far as the soil uh, plant uh, you know plant uh, nutrition is concerned obviously, low redox potential that means, in submerged condition this submerged condition is beneficial for rice by increasing the availability of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon and then iron, manganese and molybdenum. However, it causes harmful effects to the rice by decreasing the availability of sulphur copper and zinc. So, all these sulphur copper and zinc are become unavailable due to the submergence condition. However, these uh, 
especially i would like to mention the iron because the in case of submerged condition fe3 plus will reduce to fe2 plus and fe2 plus is more mobile and as a result it will uh, you know it will be uptaken by the plant uh, more easily so uh, this so nitrogen phosphorus iron manganese all these become more available to the plants in case of submerged condition another con another concept is pe concept now pe is basically used to uh, used instead of redox potential sometime to characterize the submerged soils now pe is basically minus log logarithm of e which is basically electron activity and uh, this basically the relation is e, you know pe is basically eh over 0.0591 now p is the negative logarithm of electron activity we already know that and p is the large and positive in case of strongly oxidizing system and low and negative in case of strongly negative system so nowadays we use also p for characterizing the submerged soils so in case of submerged soil you will see sequential reduction of different species just like this so this very important reaction you can see all the species all the different species are getting reduced to their reduced you know and as a result their redox potential is also getting reduced from plus 830 to minus 930 you can see at the start the oxygen reacts with the protons and electrons to produce the molecular hydrogen and then uh, this high, you know nitrate will reduce to nitrite um, you know manganese oxide will reduce to uh, mn2 plus and uh, ferric hydroxide will reduce to uh, ferrous and so on so forth so this sequential reduction will occur as a result of submergence and as a you know simultaneously we will see there is reduction of redox potential now electrochemical changes in submerged soil obviously obviously they shows a decrease in the redox potential and obviously an increase in ph of acid soil now this is very important an increase in ph of acid soils and a decrease in ph in alkaline soil this is very important as far as the uh, redox soils are concerned uh, i'm sorry submerged soils are concerned so when you start submerging a soil after a certain time if the soil is acidic you will see their ph is rising and if the soil is uh, you know alkaline you will see their ph is decreasing and ultimately after a certain period of time it will both of them will reach near to the uh, you know neutral condition which is around 6.5 to 7.5 so obviously uh, ultimately they will converge to 7 ph 7 in both the cases and also they will show the changes in specific conductance and ionic strength and obviously uh, due to the ph uh, due to the due to this uh, 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 due to the submergence and reduction of the ph you will see also drastic shift in mineral equilibria obviously and then uh, cation and anion exchange reactions and also sorption and desorption of ions so guys we have finished this uh, lecture of uh, salinity and uh, you know uh, and alkalinity and uh, submerged soils so <coughs> submerged soils is sometime problematic and sometime beneficial obviously let us uh, you know uh, submerged soil is required for the cultivation of the rice because uh, rice required a standing water with their base and uh, these uh, you know submerged condition obviously kills the nitrate nitrogen because uh, it creates the anaerobic zone however it produces the ammonium which is which is also required for the growth of the plant and also the phosphorus availability is increased in case of submerged condition and uh, you know manganese availability increase for the in case of uh, in case of submergence iron uh, availability increase in case of submergence however their uh, availability of zinc sulfur they are reduced in uh, submerged soils especially in case of rice and uh, eh is one of the major indicator of uh, the submerged soil when the eh will be positive obviously they are oxidized soil when the eh is negative they will consider you know they will basically indicate the submerged condition and uh, in the submerged soil obviously you will see different uh, you know sequential conversion of different species to their you know to their reduced counterparts i have already showed you and also uh, saline soil and sodic soil are problematic soil 
the saline soil and sodic soil can be managed by uh, you know different management practices like uh, growing different types of uh, adaptive plants and also uh, you know you know uh, by adding different types of amendments so in case of uh, in case of uh, sodic soil the common amendment is gypsum in case of uh, in case of uh, just like in case of acidic soil the common uh, uh, the common uh, um, you know uh, chemical which we add for ameliorating the acidity is lime. So, please remember this thing uh, you know the demarcation of saline soil, saline sodic soil and sodic soil they just divide you know they are divided based on the E C then their pH then their sodium absorption ratio and their exchangeable sodium percentage. So, please remember these terms and their cutoff values which will be beneficial for you during the exams. So, I hope that uh, you have learned uh, some basics of, uh, of uh, you know different types of problematic soils and how to manage the problematic soil. Oh, one more thing I, I must mention that uh, in case of saline soil you must go with the salt tolerant crop as well as you must use the you know clean irrigation water salinity free irrigation water, intermittent irrigation water and also both in case of saline and sodic soil to reclaim the saline sodic and acid soil another way is to adding some organic matter because organic matter has some beneficial effects for creating for, 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 uh, for ameliorating these uh, problematic soils. So, guys I hope that uh, you have learned something new. And obviously, for this lecture the references are the nature and properties of the soil by Niles C. Brady and Will and the chemistry of submerged soil by Purna Beruma. So, please read these books for getting more thorough knowledge about these problematic soils. So, we have finished this uh, week 6 of lectures and uh, in the next week we will start from different aspects of soil fertility and plant nutrition. Thank you guys.